Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Chapter 15, the great book of Proverbs. Proverbs gives you um, rules and regulations, but it also gives you offsets between that that is good and that that is bad. This 15th chapter is, is an interesting chapter because it uh, relates to... Um, it relates to your relations in the religious sphere, okay? Kind of, kind of how you conduct yourself, how you act, how you interact, and so forth, so that you get along, utilizing wisdom. So, having said that, a word of wisdom from our Father, chapter 15, verse 1, and it reads, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. And naturally, it's the what, what kind of soft answer? From the Word of God. Okay. Always let God's Word speak. That way, you're giving uh, advice that is wise. And when, uh, when wise advice is given, there's no room there for anger. But um, grievous words will stir up anger. It's discord. It uh, never accomplishes anything. So always stick, what's the message then? Stick with the Word of God, okay? Stick with His advice, His wisdom, and you'll never go wrong that way. Um, if, if some person then grows angry at it, they're just a no good person, okay? So, so be it. There's a few of those around, and God's Word will also tell you how to handle that. Verse 2, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. But the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Just ratchet jaw, ratchet jaw, just one foolish thing after another, never making common sense. And what, what is a prudent man? And you've been told three times in the last chapter that you should be prudent. That is to, that is to utilize common sense cautiously. That means watch your step, but use common sense as you step. You're going to be all right. You're going to stay on the true path of life, and you're going to be blessed. So um, let, let the tongue, which really is your mind, let, put your mind in gear and use, be wise so that uh, you're using knowledge. And, well, how do you gain knowledge? From the Word of God. If you're not familiar with the Word of God, you're, you're hard-pressed to, to be able to manage your life with the blessings of God. Because uh, what, what was it we learned way back in chapter 1, verse 7, and I told you, I ask you to never forget it. The beginning of wisdom is to reverence, that is to say to love Almighty God. That's the beginning of knowledge as well. You have to love Him, and if you love Him, you can't help but stay away from, to, to read His letter that He sent to you and stay away from ways of the world or false religions or some religion that's out of the sphere in which you operate, which is to say the Word of God. Well, what does it become if you get out of that sphere? Foolishness. For the words of men are foolish. Don't listen to them. That is to say, if they can't document what they're saying or teaching from the Word of God, it's nonsense. Okay, it's not wise. Verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Did you hear that? I want to read it again. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. In other words, um, uh, he, he's the keeper of the book of life. And everything is recorded. If it is bad, it's recorded right by your name. If it's good, it's recorded by your name. Let me tell you something about the dumbest thing in the world a person can do is to try to con God. Some, someone to think you can lie to God when he knows what you're thinking? You don't even have to say it out loud? 
you don't have a prayer of a chance of ever conning God because he, he knows your con. And he knows you're conning him as you do it. And his eyes see everything. And a lot of people say, I just wish I could talk to him. Well, talk. He's listening. And his eyes are open. And uh, all you have to do is just talk. He hears. And again, he keeps the book that you're judged by. That's pretty heavy stuff. When that book is cracked open and he starts reading, that's why when you know you've fallen short, you better get to repenting, okay? Because the moment you repent and ask forgiveness, he'll erase that negative stuff, but the good stays, okay? Always does. His eyes are looking and beholding both the good and the bad. Verse 4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. In other words, a wholesome tongue will give you eternal life, ultimately, if you stay with the Word. And, um, and in your life, even in the flesh, you're blessed. If you're not blessed, you need to take inventory. Something is wrong. You need to fix it. But perversiveness therein is a breach in the Spirit. In other words, um, uh, your, your tongue, a wholesome tongue, will give you life. Otherwise, a tongue that is not wholesome brings a breach in the spirit, and the spirit is your spirit, not God's. And that breach of perversiveness, anything that's perversiveness is perversive is against God. He won't buy that. He won't tolerate it. And you're, you're out on a limb without his blessings. God is supernatural. That means he is very natural. And the very spirit of life is a blessing. And it's a pleasure to serve him, to live with him, to have his blessings and his prosperity by loving him and having a wholesome tongue, repeating the word of God. People like to hear a wholesome tongue. That means your mind, of course. Because it plants seeds of truth, seeds from God's word. Verse 5 a fool despiseth his father's instructions, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Now again, what is a prudent man? A prudent man is a man that, uh, uh, that utilizes common sense uh, carefully, okay? Very carefully and cautiously. Uh, and to caution, that's what the Hebrew word actually means, to cautiously use common sense. That's watch your step. Watch what you're getting into. How does, it, how does it apply with God's word? Would God be pleased with it? Do you think God will bless it? You, you want to approach these things, and, um, uh, and you might say, well, what are my father's instructions? You're holding it. This is your father's instructions. He sent this letter to you, and he intends that you at least attempt to absorb it. And he will see to it that you absorb what is necessary for you to have a blessed life and to be able to uh, practice uh, that that is prudent. To verse 6, In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues... That's to say the gain of the wicked is trouble. The only, if, you're, if you gain um, revenue by wickedness, all it's going to do is bother you, tear you up, looking over your shoulder. You're a crook. Okay. And, and uh, you're not going to find any peace there. And sooner or later, it will all catch up with you and it will all come tumbling down. So... Always use and let in the house of the righteous is much treasure. That's the way you get ahead, okay? You know, when, when you have a righteous house, what you have, you've made yourself. You didn't steal it. You didn't con somebody out of it. You earned it, and it's yours. It's God's blessings. Don't ever apologize for riches that God gives you for serving him and um in receiving his blessings. That's why that there's much treasure there. Well, you got peace of mind. You can sleep good at night. And, and you can be content and happy. Peace of mind is a precious, precious thing. That comes, of course, 
with the righteousness. That's to say, stay on the right path and act right. Verse 7, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. There's no discretion there, no direction with the fool. Just a, a bunch of ratchet drawing, okay? If anything, you're more confused when you get through listening to them than before. But the lips of the wise disperse knowledge. Why? They plant seeds. And if you are wise and you can see someone is having trouble, you know wisdom lets you know what answer they need and what verse, scripture, if you need to apply one from God's word, that will assist them. That That is the way that uh, the wise disperse uh, knowledge. Because all wisdom comes from our Father. Oh, there's, there's wisdom of the earth and the world. But that'll just get, that'll just, that's called street smarts. It's good to know what's happening on the streets. But your true wisdom comes from the Father, not how to rip somebody off. Okay, That kind of wisdom uh, will keep you awake at night. You won't have any rest. Verse 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. It makes his day when you talk to him. That's what prayer is. When you simply say, Father, I love you. I love you for your blessings. I love you for your word and for touching me, for guiding me, for keeping your eyes on me. And you know, if, when you mess up and God corrects you a little bit, that means he loves you. Kiss the paddle and say, thank you, Lord. And straighten your case out, okay? Take care of yourself. Take care of your family. You know, people uh, will like you and everything, but there's nothing like family. And you want to remember that. Your family is precious. Uh, do you know something? God handpicked them for you. He did. I said, God handpicked them for you. So, can't be all that bad. Well, well, uh, I just have trouble with some of them. Well, God expects you to handle it. Okay? I said, he handpicked them, and he knows you can cut it if you'll do it. Trouble is, a lot of people don't want to do it. Get cracking, you know. Communicate, communicate, communicate. That's what we learned in a chapter uh, or so hence. That... Most trouble comes from lack of communication. Well, I wonder what she meant by that. Well, tell her. Okay. I wonder what he meant by that. Tell her. Tell him. Communicate. And, and don't let some little old uh, molehill turn into a big mountain in someone's mind and imagination. Keep life simple with the blessings of Almighty God. You know, when... Um, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. That means God doesn't want anything they've got. They can't sacrifice anything to him and receive a blessing. If he considers it an abomination, how do you think that would make God happy if your sacrifice was abominable to him? Like smoke in his nose, he says in one place. So you need to straighten that out, and you need to straighten it out real good because the prayer of the upright is his delight, and he will bless your family for that, you and your family. Verse 9, the way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. That's just the way it is. Two times for emphasis. I want you to remember back to chapter 6, verse 16, the six things God hates, and the seventh is an abomination. What was that seventh thing that God considered abomination? It was to have one guy stirring up trouble in the family or the community of all six things that God hates. He considers that to be an abomination and a hopeless case until a little bit of severe correction begins to take place there, okay? Verse 10, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. Um, 
correction is grievous. It's a, it, it, it takes sharp. It, it means uh, more than just correction. It means very sharp correction and discipline uh, must be placed upon he that forsakes the way. Forsakes mean it's kind of he chooses to go off the beaten path. And he that hateth reproof shall die, period. Okay. He that hates to hear God's word and hear God's truth, you're going to hell and you're going to die if you're not careful. And no one, do you know people that dedicate their life to teaching God's word, um, we dislike very much the thoughts of even one soul going to hell. Because it means somewhere along the way, maybe we could have said a word different or something. But then again, there's some people that it's very difficult to help. So you keep uh, plowing, and sometimes it takes that sharp correction. They're not gonna, I guarantee you, they're not going to like it. It'll be grievous in a way. It's sharp. But tough love is. But if you really love somebody, you'll do it. Okay. You'll do it for them to get their attention and to practice discipline. You show me a family, a church, or, a, or a, uh, any, anyone without discipline is not a church, is not a family, and is not a very happy person. It takes discipline. And, and um, tough love is a part of discipline. You know, God practices tough love. That's why he said, if, if I love you, I'm going to correct you. I'm going to chastise you. And boy, he knows how to get it done. That's a way for you to say, whoa, thank you, Jesus, and get your act together. Verse 11, hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Um, the, the word men here, Adam, that he cares. God cares about the hearts or the minds of people. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. Do you understand that destruction is a Bobdon, which is one of Satan's names? That, that's one of Satan's names. You, you can read it for yourself, this word a Bobdon in, the, in Revelation chapter 9, you know, following about verse 5. Got, uh, Satan's name is given both in Greek and Hebrew. And a Babdon just happens to be Satan's name in the Hebrew tongue, and it means destruction. Apollyon is his name in the Greek, and guess what? It means destruction also. He's bad news. He's a bad trip. And it's before the Lord. He's watching. He knows. And there is an ultimate time coming that uh, he, it makes his day when the hearts or the minds, the spiritual minds of his children listen to him. Why? Because he cares. Your heavenly Father cares. He loves you. Verse 12. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him. Neither will he go unto the wise. In other words, he's, he's going to reject correction, and he's never going to a wise person to ask good advice. You know, it doesn't do you any good. If you've got, well, I have a good friend I like to go to. Well, how, how wise is your friend? Well, he's never amounted to anything. Well, neither are you. Okay. If you want advice, you go to someone that is qualified to counsel, and their qualification, you can read it by how successful they are, and by that I mean how blessed they are of Almighty God. That's a person you can take advice from and can count on it. You can, I'll use a figure of speech, you can take that to the bank, friend, because it has proved. But at the same time, in, in the South, we have in a lot of small towns what we call the whittler's bench. I mean, they're sitting down there whittling and telling stories. Ooh, I got it all, got it all going my way, just whittling and spitting, okay? And they know everything, but they know nothing. They've got nothing. So... Um, you, you want to go to, you want to search out wisdom. And you know something? This may surprise you, but a very wise person is always anxious to help someone that wants to move up, okay, to improve themselves. A wise person will take the time. for He'll have compassion. And he will give you some very good advice. And um, it can be ever so helpful. Okay, 
Verse 13, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the spirit, I'm sorry, by, of the heart, that's to say the mind, the spirit is broken. In other words, you can tell by looking at someone's face, their countenance, whether they're happy or not. In other words, they're, they're, the, uh, that cheerful countenance um, lets you see the wisdom and the blessings of God within it. But if, if they have uh, pulled away from God and have followed hell and destruction, you can tell by looking at their face, they're sad sacks. Okay. They're, they're in a heap of hurt. And they need wisdom. They need to stop and think and repent of life and get hooked up with the tree of life, that that gives you eternal life. You got it right here in your hand. It's called the Word of God. That'll lift your countenance. And you can tell by, you know, this goes all the way back to the very beginning between Cain and Abel. When, when God saw the face of Cain and looked at his countenance, he said, what have you done? Envy, got him. Okay. God blessed his brother and didn't bless him. Verse 14. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. In other words, the heart or the mind of him that hath understanding always wants more, wants more knowledge. Never, never think you know it all. Anytime you think you know it all and you quit, you're in trouble, friend, because nobody knows it all. Okay. And, and uh, so a wise person continues study, study, study uh, for, for whatever their appetite will allow. You know, some people can study for 50 minutes and some people can study for four hours, whatever your appetite is. Um, and you judge your appetite by how long your retention, how, how you can retain thought. Okay. So, uh, but a fool, they just feed on foolishness one to the other over and over, repeating and repeating and never going anywhere. Never having or finding peace of mind. And if you don't have peace of mind, you're a troubled soul. A troubled, troubled soul. Fifteen, all the days of the afflicted are evil. But he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. He's got peace of mind. Okay. That makes the difference. Verse 16, better is little with the fear of the Lord, that's to say the love of the Lord, than great treasure and trouble therewith. I mean, that's worry, worry, worry. Well, I'm worried about tomorrow, and I'm worried about yesterday, and I'm worried about what day after tomorrow is going to bring. And I have all this treasure that I've kind of ripped and conned people out of, and I'm worried about what I'm going to do with it. It'll worry you to death. Okay. Do you know what's missing in that equation? Our Father. Okay. Better is a little with the love of the Lord. Why? Because he's going to bless you clear out of your bonnet. Okay? And it's a greater treasure than one that uh, rips people. Worry will put you to an early grave. It won't, it'll, and you know something? Some people will think, well, I just got to worry about that. It won't add one second to your life. If anything, it'll take away time. Verse 17. Better is a diner of herbs with where love is than a stalled ox and um, hatred therewith. In other words, first let's take the word stalled so that you know what it means in the Hebrew. It means fatted. Okay? When it's fatted, it's ready to butcher and you got you a ribeye steak that big. Okay? It's better to have a dinner of herbs having the truth than it is to, um, uh, than a stalled ox if hatred is therewith. Never argue, you know, if, if there's trouble in a house at mealtime, you're better off almost not to eat. You start fighting at a supper table, every, everybody ends up with upset stomachs. The, the natural juices of the body for digesting, they get carried away and it'll dump a whole load of, um, of uh, bile into your stomach and you're upset and the next thing you know, uh, you're sick. So let there be peace. Always ask God's blessings upon that meal. 
Now, personally, I would rather have the peace and the ribeye steak, okay? That, that'd suit me just fine, but I can get along with herbs if it's what it takes. That, that's spinach and good old potatoes and what have you. That'd be good with me. But uh, uh, translate the word stall to fatted, and you'll have a better, clearer picture there. Verse 18. In other words, peace is a valuable thing, peace of mind, and peace in your family. My, my, what, what upset can do to a family. And do you know something? Do you know the thing that amazes me? It really does. I see a family, and the first thing I can tell and sense spiritually is they just love each other to pieces. They really, really love each other. And yet at the same time, they almost hate each other. Because of foolishness. Lack of applying knowledge and wisdom to that love. A lot of times it's because they really, they think they're Christian. They think they serve God. But when it comes to their own business, they just have this big step of leaving God out of the equation and getting mad about everything. Whoa, I guess it, it just burns me. Burns me, burns me. Well, don't burn so easy, okay? Love your family. Do you know something? That's it. They're, they are yours, and God chose them for you. You can't cut it? Well, that's a shame. A real, real shame. Next verse, please. Verse 18. A, a watchful, I'm sorry, a wrathful man stirreth up strife. It just can't help it. But he that is slow to anger a piece of strife. In other words, it's not going to happen around him. He's going to put his mind in gear before he opens his ratchet jaw, his mouth. And it'll be, it'll be like, you know, in the Navy, on lifeboats, we have a, a container of what we call storm oil, okay? And it could be that old salt water when they're lost at sea and try, waiting for rescue, that old salt water will spray up over the bow of a little old lifeboat and it'll just scald you. By that I mean it, that salt will just take your skin and turn it inside out just about. But you can take that bag of uh, storm oil and put it up there and that oil will go out on the water and it'll calm it and that spray won't come over at you and that storm oil just calms the sea. And actually, that's what, that's what um, a, a man that uh, is slow to anger can do, is calm the situation, get it back under control. 19, the way of the slothful, that's a lazy man, is as an hedge of thorns. But the way of the righteous is made plain. In other words, um, it is made, in the Hebrew, it means it's a raised road. Okay, you call it paved if you want to. But it, it, it's a road. It's a, a road on a higher level. I'll put it that way, and that's what the Hebrew will stand that. But do you know what happens when you hit a hedge of thorns? Have you ever tried to go through a hedge of storms, thorns rather? You won't go. Okay, it'll tear you up. Verse twenty, and that's what a, that's what a lazy person will do for you. Don't ever send a lazy person to do something if you really need to get it done. It won't happen. And don't ever, ever have a lazy person on your payroll. Okay. If you have someone that's handicapped and slow, fine. You, hey, you can find a position for them. They'll turn out more ultimately than anybody. But, but, but a lazy person, that's somebody that's just like God reckons them like a set of hinges to a door, only they're to a mattress. I'll get to it later. Flopping from side to side, worthless bunch. Stay on the high road. Verse 20, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. This is a little, little difficult if you don't understand humanity, you know. Naturally, a, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. Why? She's the last thing that'll desert him. Okay. A mother will stick with a person. I don't care how bad they are, they'll never give up. They just keep trying and trying and trying, bless their hearts. That's the way God created woman, is they have more patience than anything I've ever seen. And, um, and, and the fool despises her because she keeps trying to correct him. He won't listen to her. Verse 21, 
folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. Isn't that a shame? But a man of understanding walketh uprightly. Why? Because it pays dividends. A, a, a wise man wants, and one with understanding and common sense wants to do what's right. 22. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Hunt out the wise counselor. Okay. And, um, and have him share his wisdom with you. He will. He truly will. That may, a lot of people say, well, I, I don't know how someone that's that successful would want to help me. That's just the nature of the thing, okay? That's, that's how wisdom operates. Verse 23, to continue. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, um, by giving a correct answer, okay? And a word spoken in due season, how good it is at the right time, giving good advice. It's a fantastic thing to give good advice and know that it's what? Well, what is good advice? It's God's Word. It's the advice of our Heavenly Father. It's the wisdom that comes from Him. 24, the way of life is above um, to the wise. It, it leads upward. That He may depart from hell beneath. I mean, He's got it made. You don't want to be looking forward to hell. 25, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. In other words, he will draw a line at her border and he will protect everything she's got. If she has the faith and the, the, to follow him, but um, the Lord will destroy a house of the proud. I mean, he'll let it come down, friend. That's why the blessings of God are so important. Verse 26, the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. God loves to hear them. You know, their words of pleasantness uh, really please God. That's why it makes his day when you let him know you love him, because that's what he wants from you. 27, he that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. Now, you, you know in reading that there's something wrong with it, okay? This is why I insist that you have a strong concordance. Check out that word gifts. How could it be that he that hateth gifts shall uh, live, okay? You don't hate gifts. God's gifts is charisma, and you, you certainly can't hate that. But then you'll find out if you go to the Strong's that this word gifts is bribes. And a good man hates bribes. You can't bribe him to do something wrong. It's an insult to him. And a bribe he, bribe he will not take. And so it is. Well, we'll have to stop there for this lecture and we'll pick it up in the next lecture and finish this chapter and get into the next. How, how precious these words of um, comparison. Comparison to what? Comparing God's word to the way of the world, which do you choose? Comparing good to evil, which do you choose? It's your choice. It's your life. You're the captain of your ship. You must face reality and your responsibility for your life. Nobody else is going to, okay? They may try to tell you this or that, the wise, unwise, but ultimately you are the one after you accumulate the knowledge that makes the decision that chooses right or wrong. That's what these are to help you with. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Second book of Moses called Exodus. This fantastic book of the law witnesses God keeping his promise to Abraham that he would deliver Israel out of the Egyptian captivity. The type established by God delivering his children out of bondage in Egypt is readily seen as the way out of the confusion of this world for Christians today. That is to say, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Hebrew word Exodus means in the names. In Exodus, we also learn the names or seed lines through which Jesus Christ would be born in the flesh. Exodus, as taught by Pastor Arnold Murray, is available on audio cassette tape or VHS tape. The 13 audio cassette tape set is our item 126, and the suggested donation is $52. Or if you prefer the 11 VHS tape set, 
It, it is our item 671.13, and the suggested donation is $275. Partial tape set orders are welcome. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, hey, all over Canada. The spirit moves. you got a question, you share it, won't you? We're happy to say very soon we're in a lot more cities in Canada, and we thank our Father for that privilege. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, we uh, want to say to you in China, you know, as much as we have outside of Canada and America, we have more students in China than anywhere else, and our prayers are with you. And we just ask that the Father bless you in this time of trouble. And, um, and trust God, have faith in Him above all times. And those of you, if you have a question, you share it with us. Won't you please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. Let's don't judge people. Now, those of you that do listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer, at the end of the hour, will give you a mailing address. You got a you got a prayer request. You don't need that number, and you don't need an address because God knows what you're thinking right now. His eyes are upon you. God's eyes are upon the good and the evil. I hope He sees good in you because you love His Word, and uh, and you need to ask forgiveness for that. That isn't. Uh, let Him know you love Him. That's the main thing He wants from you. Hosea six six. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct. Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, questions. Danielle from Texas, 10 years old. What is the difference between lying and joking? That's an interesting question, Danielle. Uh, lying is something that will do somebody harm. It can do harm to a person's character, their feelings or even property necessarily. And joking is a sense of humor when, when you're teasing someone or something of that, and when it ceases being teasing or joking is when it begins to do harm. When, when it seems like it's a sharp tongue that cuts, that's wrong. That's not funny. It is not funny to hurt someone, and it is not funny to destroy someone's property. It is not destroy. It is not fun to cause pain. So that's what lying will do. And one of the worst things in the world is a lying gossiper. Oh, I, I really, I'm telling you what. I, if there's any one person that I have trouble with, it's a gossiper. Okay, I just, I really have trouble with that. Um, it, it means someone, if you have confidence in someone and share something and it ends up on the front page, okay, uh, you, you can't trust that person. That wasn't a person you could trust, and that's very disappointing, okay? But anyway, uh, that's the difference. Thank you for studying. That's a good question. But uh, do have a sense of humor. Don't, let, don't ever let some religionist take that away from you, all right? The, the very people of Israel, Isaac means laughter, okay? And we do enjoy ourselves, okay? Jesse from Mississippi, what verse in the Bible does, does it say, don't teach my people to fly? Ezekiel chapter 13, along about, it begins about verse 18 and goes on down through verse 20, okay? And what it is, it's God's outreaching save, saving arms, he says, the daughters of Jerusalem sew these kerchiefs or pillow slips and put them over my hands of salvation where I, I intend to save them direct. And they teach them to fly to save their souls, and I'm against it. Naturally, that's the rapture doctrine. God's against it. Ezekiel 13, 18 through 25, let's say. Uh, Katona from Maryland. Are you allowed to get remarried? I am a teacher of the Lord Jesus Christ who forgives all sin. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. And there are uh, reasons lawfully to acquire a divorce. And when 
you acquire a divorce in that way, you are allowed to remarry. But in the marriage vows, when you take them, you you promise to be together as uh, until death do you part, or as long as you both shall live. Then you're automatically allowed to remarry. I'm having to go to this length because you don't tell me what your situation is. If you're a sinner of the worst kind at one time, and you leave your family, and then you find the Lord Jesus Christ, and you ask him to forgive you, and you're a new creature. You, start, you have a fresh page, and you start all over, and you are free to remarry because of the blood shed on the cross by the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. I have to teach that these are not unpardonable sins, a divorce, or adultery even. If, if, if there is forgiveness there, and that forgiveness from our Father, but God gives us, that's the beauty of Christianity, is forgiveness and a fresh start, okay? And um, that's, that's what makes Christianity so wonderful. Bobby from Virginia, why do we say that Jesus is the son of David? Because of the genealogy. And that's important because it's the key of David. It's the very seat of the key of David. And as it is written in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, concerning the church of Philadelphia, that's the church of brotherly love, that uh, they know who the Kenite is that claims to be of our brother Judah, and he's not, he's a liar. And uh, that uh, one that has that knowledge has the key of David. And that key opens doors and no one can close it and it can close doors and lock it and no one can open it. Because it's truth. It's the truth. And ultimately what it leads to is you know the difference in the true Christ and the fake Christ. Because the fake Christ certainly did not come from David. The Lord Jesus Christ did. Uh, Annie from Arkansas. Who is Mary's mother? Mary's mother was a daughter of Aaron. Mary's mother uh, was um, uh, Elizabeth, the wife of uh, Zechariah, the mother of John the Baptist. She was, uh, uh, Mary's mother and Elizabeth's mother were sisters. And they were daughters of Aaron because she was married to a, a Levitical priest. Um, that is to say, Elizabeth's mother was because Elizabeth was a full-blood Levite. But, Mary's, uh, but um, Mary was married to a, a son of Judah, or David. Therefore, Christ, being the child of God, was both of the house of Levi and the house of Judah, meaning what? That he was Melchizedek after the order of Melchizedek forever, meaning he was the king and the priest. Lord of lords, king of kings, lord of lords. Okay, And um, it was through the mothers that that came forth. Documentation, Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3, if you understand the genealogy of uh, Mary's uh, father and so forth. In-laws, they're called in Luke 3. Linda from North Carolina. I have epilepsy. My brother told my children epilepsy is a sign. I have a devil in me. He said Matthew 17, 14 through 18 proves this is true. Last year my brother died and I have not seen my children since 2001. I read, I read the Bible every day. Is it true that epilepsy uh, proved I have a devil and, or am I paying for my past sins. Uh, you're paying for your brother's past sins for saying such a thing. Epilepsy is a disease or a, 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 an injury even during birth sometimes. Um, it is a disease, an injury. It has nothing to do with an evil spirit. Are there evil spirits? Yes, there are evil spirits, but certainly there is also epilepsy. And your brother did a very bad thing, even though he is past and gone, and he knows it by now, to lay that trip on you. And um, uh, read uh, Mark chapter 4, where you have both Christ uh, 
healing people of diseases and casting out demons. Two separate things. Okay. So, uh, Linda, get, don't, I, I want you just to scratch everything he told you. That is not what Matthew chapter 17 means at all, period. God loves you. And God loves people that are handicapped. And epilepsy, is, in a sense, is a form of your handicap. But uh, that doesn't have anything to do with your soul. And uh, when you've repented of your past sins, like all everyone, they're erased. Don't even bring them up again. They're gone. They don't exist. And you're a new creature. Don't, Linda, let someone rob you of that, okay? I pray that your family can see and understand. Thank you. Stan from Vermont. Romans 11, verse 7. Why is the Father so against false teachers if he placed a slumber on all of Israel except the elect? Or is this the same as 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 and 11 when the slumber comes into effect? Well, there are some people that don't have the gumption or the will to stand against the false Christ. And it's better that they be blinded so that they have an opportunity in the millennium to come to truth. And don't, don't say all were, okay, because they weren't. Seven simply means spiritual completeness, however many that is. And there are a lot more Gentiles than there are of the house of Israel that see truth. And follow truth. They're not even included in that number, but there there are many, many more of the kings and queens of the ethnos. So, and that's biblical, very biblical, documented in Revelation chapter twenty-one, um, verses twenty through twenty-four. Okay, so, uh, but it's God's love for His children, knowing who can cut it and who can't. Brenda from Oklahoma, what is Corbett? I, I'm sure what you're asking is Corbin and whoever typed, who we need to, I will correct it just a little bit. I'm sure you mean the word Corbin, Corbin. It, it is a term that it means it's a gift. And it's a gift for the temple, okay? It's a, it's a, it goes a little further than that. It's kind of a, a gift for those in the temple, okay? And this is why Jesus really came down on those that said, you, you dishonor your mother and your father because if you say it's a gift or Corbin, then, then uh, it's okay to give it to the church and let your mom and dad starve. That's a lie. And Jesus documented that it was a lie. Okay. And um, so you, you, you uh, love your family and you help your family. That's what the word Corbin is, is uh, where some preacher rips off a, fam a family member that um, rather than, and, and they'll say, well, my mother and dad need some of this. Well, you give it to us and it's okay. okay. Give it to the church or you, you'll receive this envelope and you send me X number of dollars and God will bless you. That's a lie. God does not send out beggars. And that's why Christ brought up the word Corban. And uh, don't ever let some preacher tell you you can let your family hurt as long as you give everything. And this, this means uh, everything to them. Okay. Diane from West Virginia. At the end of time, will demons torment people? And if they do, what will God do about it? Well, hey, we're in the end of time, and there are demons in the world today, evil spirits, more correctly said. There have been evil spirits in the world since the beginning of time. They're called familiar spirits in the Old Testament. And what does God do about it? In Luke chapter 10, verse 18 and 19, he, give us power, he gives us power over all of our enemies in his name. And hey, we can, we can take those evil spirits and tell them where to go with anointing our people and casting out that wickedness, evil thing, and send it back where it came from, which is death to them. When you do that, they get afraid of you. And they won't bother you or anybody around you because they know what they'll have coming. Now, there's evil spirits right now. There's not one behind every bush, but I guarantee you as a pastor of many, many, many years, I guarantee you there are evil spirits. Larry from Georgia. 
Will the Antichrist be a political figure? No, the Antichrist will not be a f political figure. He is, as Revelation 13, 11 declares, he is a religious figure. Okay, Why? Because he's coming as Christ and, and performs miracles in the sight of man. And most people will think it is Christ. Come to fly him away. I've come to load, take a load right out of here. Jump in my wagon, and boy, are they ready. They're ready to jump in. Any moment, any moment. That's not biblical. It was brought forth by preachers, and uh, I should say false teachers, to be more accurate. And I, I know I'm just winning friends and influencing people, but that's the way it goes. Anyone can read Revelation 13, beginning with verse 11, and find out for themselves. The first multi-headed beast is the political one world system in Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 and 2 and really culminates in verse 4. Mary from South Carolina, I am old and have diabetes and I have to take a lot of medicine and I get confused and I can't keep up with Pastor Murray. Will God hold that against me? Absolutely not. Okay. No, um, you know, uh, you're keeping up with me quite well. You don't have to memorize everything that I have to memorize. You know, God's word is a novel in a sense. It's about one man's family and everybody that comes in contact with him. That would be the Lord Jesus Christ. So read it to like that and it makes it a lot easier to keep up with it because it's a story of those that would bring Christ forward and Christ what he would accomplish and so forth and how the end would come to be. It's so simple, okay? Don't make it difficult. You're doing real good. Um, sometimes um, you can get kind of a chemical imbalance by, too much, by medicine, but that's fine. And when, when you're a diabetic, you have to take uh, insulin in many cases or whatever is uh, your own. And uh, Luke was a medical doctor. A physician. So God expects us to utilize the advice of a, a wise physician. You're doing good, okay? Real good. I'm proud of you. Okay, Mary? You're doing good. South Carolina, Mary? Fine. Karen from Georgia. What does the Bible say about cremation? Well, if, if you're on a fixed income, then um, cremation is, is A-OK, -okay, okay? Why? Because let's document it so that you know what we're talking about. In the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes, it says when you get older, you know, your grinders don't grind as well. That's your choppers, your teeth. They don't. And when you get in high places, you're a little wobbly, you know, not like you were when you were a young sprout. And, um, and the music gets harder. The birds don't sing as loud as they used to, you know. And then air of the silver cord parts, that's the spinal cord, and the, 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 uh, this bowl break, that's the head, you die, okay? Then instantly, not sometime later, but instantly, as it is written in Ecclesiastes 12, 6, and 7, your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, meaning your nephesh, your soul, goes instantly to the Father that gave it. So... For a person on a fixed income, cremation is just fine. A lot less expensive. Because why? The person's already gone. Okay, The person instantly returns to the Father that gave it. And what we have left is simply the organic matter that we have partaken of down through our life. Nancy from Minnesota. Where in the Bible does it talk about unclean animals and not eating pork? Well, the... Um, in the New Testament, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Don't ever let some man judge you about marrying. That means like even remarrying, like I had a question earlier. If, if you've repented, you can remarry. And don't ever let someone judge you about receiving food that, listen carefully, that God created to be received. God did not create scavengers to be received. Okay. They'll make you sick. They will ultimately really make you a very sick person. And you find out who they are truly in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 11. 
Or you can get a pretty good list of them in the New Testament in Acts chapter 10 and 11 where God allowed a sheet to come down before Peter full of filthy animals. And Peter said, I'm not eating any of those scavengers. And God said, I'm not talking about you eating unclean animals. There is a Gentile at the gate that you're going to bring salvation and don't you ever call any man uncommon again. Uh, let me rephrase that because I almost misspoke. Don't Peter, don't ever call a man un, a common again. Uh, because at that time, after di Christ died on the cross, salvation was open to everyone, whomsoever will. Stephen from Minnesota. Is it wise to break fellowship with your family over things like eating pork and drinking beer? Of course you shouldn't. Eating pork and drinking beer is, if you want to consider it, a, a, a sin, and it's according to how much you indulge, okay? Everything in moderation, but eating pork is a, is a sin to your health, not to your soul necessarily. So uh, what God did, God sent us our family and we're to help them. Okay, Why would you break fellowship over that? You can cut it. You're... You, you put on your uh, big girl um, uh, self, or this is Stephen, we don't want to say big girl, do we? Anyway, you, you just brace up there and know God expects you to be there, be nice, and use wisdom, and you're to help them. Okay, I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word, but most important, true wisdom, God loves you for it, okay? You, you make God's day, and boy, is he going to make yours. That's how blessings flow, okay? So you stay in his word. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, blessing God, he will always, I do mean always, bless you. Most important, though, now you listen to me, and you listen real good. This is most important, that you stay in his word every day. In his word, is a good day, even with trouble. It's still a good day. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. book of Deuteronomy. The law was given as our schoolmaster. Have you been to school on God's Word? Certainly one way to go there is to study the book of Deuteronomy. Probably the most, the most exciting thing that Deuteronomy has to offer for you is that great song of Moses that those that overcome the false Messiah in the end generation will be singing. The Law itself being the schoolmaster that keeps us out of trouble in these flesh bodies. Again, an education in taming that part of you that oftentimes needs taming through the old schoolmaster, that great book, Deuteronomy, the law, and its set ways of keeping you from harm's way even in this generation. You're going to enjoy it.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're going to talk about wilderness today. The wilderness is translated from several, several Greek and Hebrew words in the manuscripts. But I think the prime and uh, basically the one most often used and is used in most of what we will be